In this review of the week's news, red zoners are unhappy on the government's latest compensation offer, upset locals are pleased an old house has been moved from their subdivision, and the country's first wheelchair sports fishing spot opens. This is CTV News Week in Review, I'm Jared McCulloch. A cold snap this week had emergency services working in overdrive, dealing with multiple accidents and a number of fatal crashes due to black ice. The Christchurch City Council's Transport Operations Centre was in overdrive this morning, with temperatures below zero causing headaches for motorists heading into work. Indeed, there was um, quite a number of incidents around the network and obviously a, a, a lot of additional congestion um, as well, so yeah, it's been um, um, quite a bit happening. The city was expected to get as low as minus four overnight, but it was noted to be colder, causing large amounts of black ice around the city. There was also a fatal crash at around 8am near Tai Tapu, where a woman died when her vehicle collided with a school bus. Caution was advised for a number of state highways around the region as well due to icy roads. And the council's Transport Operations Centre manager says they're focusing on a number of areas to help increase safety, advising motorists to take it slower on the daily commute to work. Two, two primary things. One is that uh, drivers are um, obviously trying to take it easy, take it safer um, and manage their risk. Um, so there's a, a bunch of additional congestion as a result of that. Um, for instance, on the Northern Motorway, we observe journey times of up around 65 minutes versus the 20 to 30 minutes uh, normally. So quite a lot of con additional congestion. Um, however, we, we um, uh, recommend that drivers continue to travel safely and and keep themselves safe, even if it does mean they're a little bit late to work. The New Zealand Transport Agency is urging motorists around the region to keep their speeds down, as the black ice won't be going away anytime soon, with the days ahead due to see similar frosty conditions. And Cooney agrees. Um, we saw a number of incidents, uh, crashes, generally minor fender benders this morning, but um, uh, quite a number of them, and a lot of um, people just sliding around in general because of the additional ice. So we really want people to keep themselves safe, and um, yeah, unfortunately, it might mean you're a little late to work but, or, or wherever you're heading, but um, that's definitely a preferable situation. A few minor crashes were reported by the transport centre due to icy cold conditions, most of them on the northern and southern motorway. But he says there are other areas commuters need to look out for. So Northern Motorway, the bridges this morning, there were some issues, the old, old Waimak Bridge and actually the new Waimak Bridge, so that general vicinity. Um, the bridges on the Southern Motorway, uh, there's a number of uh, bridges on the on the, uh, the council roading network as well. Um, so the real the real hot spots are actually around the bridges. Um, Curlitz Road was, um, shall I say, interesting to watch. A um, number of people travelling up the Curlitz Road bridge uh, and um, yeah, sliding around. I saw some very near misses of vans and concrete mixes etc so um, you know, just the bridges really are an area to watch out for. Forecasters believe there'll be a similar picture of cold temperatures on the horizon and Cooney has some key messages. Um, when you're travelling avoid sudden changes in direction, braking, um, tap the brakes if you're um, starting to slide just try and gently tap the brakes um, essentially simulating what ABS does um, but also um, watch out for um, high risk areas such as shady spots, um, bridges, bridges are notorious for um, icing up just because of the airflow above and below the bridges um, causes ice to rapidly form. Um, so just again, take care please. Yes. Christchurch City is expected to reach minus four overnight with Hamner Springs sitting on minus five and Oxford even colder on minus six. So it'll be a cold night ahead. Jared McCulloch, CTV News. They say it's not enough. Owners of uninsured homes red zone following the quags have rejected the Crown's latest compensation offer, saying 80% of land value is unacceptable, and they'll go back to court if they have to. Here's Chelsea Daniels. Sarah announced today that they have re-evaluated their offer for all uninsured red zone properties. The 50% offer made earlier this year has been scratched and raised to 80% after public outcry. The 26 homeowners in this category took the matter to the Supreme Court, who ruled that the government must reconsider their compensation offer. Despite the change of offer, homeowners are still unhappy with the proposed deal, as it doesn't provide any payment for the value of improvements on those properties. It is an improvement from um, 2012 um, uh, offers that were proposed, but it's still not good enough, unfortunately. Um, it sounds like we will be going back to court. Grant Cameron, solicitor for the Quake Outcasts Group, said today, 
Our residential homeowners have had to suffer appalling circumstances in consequence of the Crown's attempt to take their land for next to no value. Unfortunately, today's decision reflects both a disregard for those persons' welfare and for the Supreme Court judgment. Cancern spokesperson Leanne Curtis agrees that 80% is too low an offer for the land value, but is sceptical of the owners pushing for more money for their uninsured properties. I think they're justifying the 80% offer on land value as a, hey, uh, we're giving you most of it. <laughs> but this is a reflection of your insurance status. Well, the fact that they won't get any money on their house, on their dwelling, that's, an, that's the reflection on their insurance status. I think it's just a bit stupid. She says that the payouts should stop with the land value, as there are consequences for not insuring your property. That won't necessarily make everybody happy, but I think that there is a certain, uh, you can certainly justify, or the, the Crown can justify why they chose to not pay anything on the dwelling itself, because it was uninsured. If you were to lose it in a fire, you wouldn't get your house back. David Lawson Miller, spokesperson for the Quake Outcast Group, disagrees, certain that if the shoe was on the other foot, he wouldn't mind his uninsured neighbours getting the same payout as him. There is a right and wrong you know, situation here. Um, if, if the uninsured person gets as much as an insured person, well, fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I know I'm harping back to the same old point again. Fact is, the government wants your property. And if they want your property, then they must pay for it. Um, that's, that's just the way it is. The draft plan is open to public comment and the Minister's decision is expected by the end of the month. Cameron anticipates that the 26 Quake outcasts that own vacant and uninsured commercial properties might accept the Crown's new offer. They would now be in line to receive 100% of their 2007-2008 land value. Chelsea Daniels, CTV News. And an attempt by Southern Response to warn people of a class action hasn't stopped more claimants signing up to take on the insurer. A move from earthquake insurer Southern Response has sparked questions over a class action against the government-owned insurance company. A newsletter released by the insurer told policyholders they are committed to work alongside and support claimants, willing to take questions and deal with concerns to get their claim moving. The insurer is also offering two hours of free legal advice to help answer claimants' questions about the proposed class action. It's very clear that the insurer is now very worried about the class action growing and that it will be you know, filed in the court sometime shortly. So we think there is, this flags a clear attempt to undermine the class action while we still remain some possibility of doing so. This follows a gathering last Tuesday night where well over 200 frustrated Southern Response policyholders turned out for a private meeting at the Cardboard Cathedral to consider whether to join a class action against the insurer. With the lawyer in charge, Grant Cameron, pleased with the turnout. Very, very good. Uh, exactly what we expected. Uh, people, I think, are highly motivated and very, very keen to get cracking, so um, couldn't have gone better. The hour-long meeting saw Cameron explain alongside lawyer Francis Cook QC to talk about the process of a litigation team who will fund the case and how a class action works. A no win no fee basis means just that. If the class action is unsuccessful in court, claimants wouldn't have to pay any damages and legal costs that's covered under the litigation team. But if the action is successful, claimants would pay fees of no more than 20% of the claim, with some paying a lot less. And he says they've seen an increase in those willing to sign up since the meeting. Well, we've had probably an increase of about 80 in terms of registration and we, the funds are still going. So we're very, very comfortable with the way the um, growth of the class is progressing. However, Cameron says concerned policyholders unsure about the class action would have been in contact with the insurance company to get more information on the individual claim and says the details they've displayed would be the same from any other legal advisory. The information or the advice that we're giving is uh, just the same as any other law firm would give in these circumstances. So we think it does illustrate there is concern by the insurer that its practices will now be exposed in the courtroom. He says claim holders have been advised to talk to Southern Response to get advice, leaving it up to them to join the class action if they wish. We will welcome them with open arms, um, 
appeal to the questions, and then we're very happy to talk to the uh, legal advisors. Uh, everybody who wants to join the class action is being told and has been told that they should be taking independent legal advice anyhow. But he believes in terms of the action, it's all go from here. We think everything's on track. We've extended the uh, end of the class so all the people who have previously settled with sudden response may now join the action. We were approached by quite a large number of people who have been through the whole process and have come to some sort of settlement with uh, the insurer but have been very disappointed with either the quality of the work or the value of the settlement. The deadline for claim holders to sign up closes at the end of the month. Jared McCulloch, CTV News. Still to come, why Nui residents are told to wait and neighbours say no to an old house. Welcome back. Why Nui residents have been pleading with the council to get a new treatment system to stop sewerage overflowing into Akaroa Harbour, but they've been told it's simply not a high priority. It was a tough decision for the Christchurch City Council, proposing to continue on with Phase 2 of the area's wastewater scheme. But it's not going to begin any time soon, with the council voting against immediate action and reviewing the options to combat the problem. This has been an ongoing issue for Wainui residents. Back in May 2013, the wastewater from 34 properties was diverted from Akaroa Harbour to council-owned land. However, since the Canterbury earthquakes, plans had stalled with the council books being in the red, delaying the vital part of stage two to go forth. Being missed from the original draft long-term plan process, concerned people in the area shared their thoughts with the council. The septic tanks do leak. Now, in a large storm events, they overflow and they go into the harbour. The big problem I can see in Wainui is uh, maintenance of the septic tanks. Now, a lot of properties change hands and when they change hands, the new property owners don't know anything about septic tanks. Now, they have to be maintained, which means they have to be cleaned between three and five years, have to be completely cleaned out. At that time, many councillors pushed to see this resolved, with a $7 million project to go ahead and continue stage two. But one councillor wasn't convinced all options had been exhausted. Council has continually over, I think the, 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 the time frame is 20 years, said that at some stage this is going to happen. And now we are in a totally different situation. We've had a major natural disaster we're, and we're still saying the same thing. So I'm, I'm just wondering, I haven't seen anything that council staff had have been given direction to maybe look at options. Option 3 was likely to go forth today to continue with Stage 2 as planned, which would see construction take place at the start of July this year. However, many councillors were in favour of Option 1 to create a cost-sharing agreement with the 66 full-time residents to pay for new pumps and connections to the council's main line pressure pump. And some of the local body representatives were all for the scheme to begin development immediately but were more in favour of a shared proposal. I think they should be paying something towards this. I'd actually prefer they'd be paying the lot. Uh, but, you know, some kind of cost sharing, I think, uh, is absolutely appropriate. I think there should be some sort of cost sharing arrangement. Um, I, I think it's really unfair that for a, a small amount of people that the burden is placed on all the ratepayers. I think that's actually unfair. When we talk, when we hear a talk of um, overflows and pits overflowing, etc., that's personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. And we, people do have to take an element of that themselves. And it just seems to be lacking here. However, 10 of the 14 councillors voted against the option of continuing with the current scheme, voting instead to explore other alternatives. Now residents will have to wait until 2018 for any action to take place. Jared McCulloch, CTV News. They've bowed to public pressure. The company that breached a bylaw by relocating an old house to a Burwood subdivision is taking it away. And the locals are pleased. Chelsea Daniels reports. Construction on a relocated, refurbished house has halted due to a public outcry in Travis Country. The owner will remove the house from the corner section after the community publicly announced its distaste over the building, not complying with the same building codes that they had to. We spoke to the residents last week and there have been further developments made by the community. I managed to get in contact with uh, the property owner. I thought it would be really good to, just to have a nicely civil sit down and, and a chat so that um, I could pass on the, the concerns of the residents in the area and also get her point of view. Because what, what I found was um, 
A lot of people were making... It didn't look flash what had turned up there, and it appeared she was breaching a lot of covenants um, and building consent even. But I think it's very hard for people to make a, a judgment or a call on something when you don't know all the facts. So I thought it would be a really good idea to pass on all our concerns and get exactly what her uh, intentions with the property were. She was aware of a couple of the covenants that um, she hadn't met um, and said that there were some of the other covenants that... Um, I brought up, she said that she wasn't aware of. Residents also held a meeting outside of the property where 150 interested members of the community showed up in support. It was a really good meeting. Um, everybody came away from it with the same views, that they just wanted uh, it to be fair and equitable to everybody, that everybody should play by the same rules. Build Green Limited's lawyers spoke on behalf of the company today. The Travis Country Project was to provide Christchurch residents with affordable, quality, healthy homes using a fast process and to save a perfectly good home from ending up wasted in the landfill. This project has generated growing opposition from the Travis Country residents and in response to this, a letter from our office was delivered this afternoon to Dr Carlene Edwards, Chief Executive at the Christchurch City Council. The letter advises that the project is being abandoned and that the two houses will no longer be established on the section at 12 Travis Country Drive. The company were moved by the residents' passion for their built community and are sorry for any distress or uncertainty they have caused over the past two weeks. Simply put, Build Green's client failed to appreciate the significance of the matter and the Travis community's strength of feeling about the matter. For that, they are sorry. Travis community residents have a passion for their built community and an expectation of what is appropriate development, and that is now well understood. The second house that was due to arrive on the site will now not be moved. Arrangements have been made for the house which is currently on the Travis Country Drive site to be removed as soon as possible. All in all, Richie believes that the Travis Country community has become closer over the event. Without a doubt, it's, it's brought everybody closer together in a more community spirit. And, and the good thing was one of the meetings that was had last Wednesday night was um, every, nobody had a lot of animosity. They all just wanted the same thing. They, to, to be fair and reasonable, they're all like-minded people. Um, didn't let it get to them personally or, or, or become a personal attack. They just wanted certain guidelines to be met. Chelsea Daniels, CTV News. Still to come, the country's first wheelchair accessible sports fishing platform opens to Canterbury locals. Welcome back. An old footbridge across the Heathcote sparked unusual debate at Council this week. But with a newer bridge within walking distance, the Council believes the demolition is unlikely to upset local residents. Another bridge bites the dust, but it wasn't an easy decision for the Christchurch City Council today, who voted to demolish the nearly 55-year-old bridge in Woolston. Known as the Catherine Street or Radley footbridge, the structure has sat broken and buckled for nearly five years due to the earthquakes. It was built back in the early 60s, located at a confluence of waterways in the Heathcote River. However, since the Canterbury quakes, the walkway has been closed to the public due to extensive damage, causing parts of the bridge to move out of place. What we're advising, you've got a bridge 35 seconds away. Basically, it wouldn't be built, as we've said, uh, if the... Uh, if the other bridge had been in place at the time that this was built, it is severely damaged. We want to try and get on with the program to uh, try and get the uh, city back into some normality and uh, some we feel have got more strategic importance than others. Earlier this month, Council were informed about the proposed removal or repair of the Woolston Bridge, looking at the possibility of replacing it, but the price was excessive. It's not the only bridge in the area, just a short walk less than 100 metres downstream from the soon-to-be-demolished structure stands a more modern footwalk, built two decades later in the 80s. And Tim Scandred believes it's a no-brainer that the earthquake damage bridge should go. As if this were in my ward and I had two bridges 35 seconds apart in the situation that we're in and to move forward, there would be no question that I would be more than happy for this bridge to go and I would be telling my community that. However, Hagley Ferrymead Councillor Yanni Johansson says nothing's been done to inform the public, wanting a consultation on the damaged bridge, an extra cost to the council. For the local residents that live in this area, they have no knowledge of what this proposal is 
and have no, had no chance to give their views. I know you've said that it's not significant, but if you look at places like Midway Bridge, for example, if you look at um, some of the Helmore's Lane is another one, the community have expected to be involved and they have been able to, but not in this particular case. The cash-strapped local body had four options to go by from a skirt report back in November last year, with removing the bridge noted as being the preferred choice, which will now go ahead. So here were the numbers. Demolishing the footbridge would cost just over $141,000 and it will be removed in the near future. Other options included a few touch-ups of the existing timber piles, costing over half a million dollars to repair, but it would only have a lifespan of 10 years and still be subjected to earthquake risk. Repairing the bridge to pre-earthquake standards would be slightly more expensive at around $600,000 to repair the timber piles and would have a simplified design, but still at a risk through an earthquake. And the most expensive to fully restore the Catherine Street footbridge and bring it up to earthquake strengthening standard would cost $735,000, a price tag the council wasn't willing to pay. In the four years, and, and I believe to council, and I don't know about to councillors, we have had no one come and have had any concerns about this bridge being closed. Um, it just hasn't featured in a public radar. So the footbridge will be demolished, a date not yet set when it will be gone in the near future. Jared McCulloch, CTV News. It was delayed by the earthquakes, but now New Zealand's first wheelchair access for sports fishing is all go. Chelsea Daniels reports. It began with just two mates talking about fishing. Now, six years later, the first wheelchair accessible platform for sport fishing is open at Kayapoi. I camp at Nelson over Christmas and I was talking with Bruce Mote there one day and um, he said I buy a fishing licence and I, only, I should only uh, have to pay half price because I can only half use it because I can't get anywhere to fish. And I suggested, well, what if you had a nice platform to fish from? So that initiated the idea. The platform is a safe and accessible site which can accommodate up to three fishermen in wheelchairs at a time. It's New Zealand's first wheelchair sport fishing platform and Ron hopes that it's not the last. I've got other ideas of making other areas available to um, wheelchair fishermen but they're subject to fishing regulations so we'll have to get some changes made. However, the Canterbury earthquakes halted the construction of the platform. We're ready to put it in and the 2011 and 12 earthquakes come and it just totally annihilated the whole bank area here and it had to be rebuilt. Ron's mate of 40 years, Bruce, remembers a time before the platform where it was much more dangerous to go out and catch a fish. Oh, it used to be, yeah. You know, you'd crawl along on your bum through bits of muck and gunk and broken glass and all that kind of stuff just to get down here. But, you know, if, if you wanted to catch a fish, that's, that's what you aim for. But, yeah, you, it could be quite quite deadly and then if the tide and that come in the wrong times you have to get out and get up the bank pretty quick. And it seems the guys have snagged a good spot on McIntosh's hole. And we've got a part of the river that everyone has always wants to fish in is, is, is McIntosh's. It's one of these spots when Ron come up to me and told me he was getting a spot here at McIntosh's I, I, well, I just couldn't believe it for a start off, you know. But it's not all about catching big fish. I've always said, that, and I've said to a lot of people, fishing and going down to rivers or even down to the beach is far better than taking antidepressant pills. It's something that's always... Is all, the, the river and the beach and that, every time you come down, there's always something different going on. And Brett, a peer support worker at New Zealand Spinal Trust, agrees. Uh, yeah, it'd be really good to get people from a bird spinal unit that have recently had injuries out fishing. Um, it's a nice relaxing spot. Um, it'd just be a really nice sort of therapeutic uh, thing for him to do, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Especially after a traumatic injury. The first fish is yet to be caught off the McIntosh Hole platform, which opened to the public on Sunday. Chelsea Daniels, CTV News. And that is CTV News Week in Review. I'm Jared McCulloch. Have a great weekend.
Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.